Thank you all for coming. I'm Summer. I'm the curator here at the museum. Uh, before we get started, everybody please take a second to turn off or silence your cell phone so we don't have any disruptions. Um, as for announcements, this year we're offering both an in-person summer camp and a camp to go for kids. The in-person camp will run from June 14th to June 18th. Enrollment is now open and there are just a few spots left. So if you're interested, contact Jennifer for more information. Her card is on that back table with the tablecloth. Um, the Camp to Go, which will guide summer campers on a tour around the island, will be on sale starting June 1st. Contact Thea for more information. Her card is also on that back table. Um, just a general announcement, if you're enjoying these programs, and especially if you're streaming online, uh, please consider making a donation to the museum. You can donate online at ameliamuseum.org slash donate or in person at the museum. Um, some of you might have noticed a survey on your chairs. If you did get one, please um, fill it out and then return it to the basket on that same table. For upcoming programs, next Wednesday, May 26th, We'll be having a special program from 5.30 to 7.30. In December, Marty Hilton presented Fernandina's Old Town Spanish Plan, Revisiting Design Guidelines, and conducted a survey about the preservation of Old Town's historic grid. As a continuation of this project, Wednesday's program will be an interactive public workshop. Our June brown bag lunch will be with Tammy Kozak who will discuss her experience taking on a major restoration of her home in the historic district. And then our June 3rd on 3rd will be, the, will be with Nick Dionis, who will discuss the history of boat building <coughs> on the island. Um, so that's a little preview of what's coming up, but tonight we have Frank Opel. He began as a Fort Clinch volunteer in the Fort's interpretive program in the 1980s. After college, he began a career in 1993 with the Florida Park Service, for which he has served ever since. He is an avid reader, researcher, and collector of military antiques. Everyone, please welcome Frank. Well, thank you. Thanks for the uh, museum for having me come out here tonight. I'll talk with you about my second book that had come out on um, August, of course, during the pandemic. Um, if you're not a member of the museum, you should join the museum. I think it's a wonderful institution. It really has a wonderful collection of the history of the island and of the county. I think you can learn about um, our community, and uh, it's important that you be involved in things like that. Also, out the fort, if you uh, haven't been out to the fort, take advantage of it. It's a wonderful state park. It's one of the eight oldest state parks uh, created in 1935. And if you haven't been to the fort, you're missing out on some really good history there. But we also have the three miles of shoreline and birding and camping and all types of activities out there. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Fernandina and Fort Clinch, of course, during the war. And the, the focus is um, pretty much going to focus on the buildup of southern forces, the importance of Fernandina for the Union, and then the large recruitment efforts that went on to recruit men of color into the federal army. And then I'll close out with the end of the war as and the volunteers and troops mustering out, but the veterans coming back here and then rebuilding the town, basically getting Fernandina to grow again. So, <clears throat> let's see, are we good? <clears throat> so it's interesting enough that Fernandina is the eighth largest city in Florida at that time, has a population of about 1,400 citizens. Um, it had two delegates that went to the... Uh, uh, ordinance of secession that was to be signed, the Constitutional Convention in Tallahassee. Joseph Finnegan was one of them, James Cooper was the other. The town was pro-Southern, there's really no doubt about it. There's a small fraction of Federalists that had moved here from the North and had voted for John Bell in the 1860 election, but the majority of the town had voted for um, John Breckinridge, the Democratic candidate uh, for president. And he had been the vice president under James Buchanan. It's interesting to note that Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot in Florida. So he didn't get the vote for Lincoln in Florida. So uh, Joseph Finnegan, he was from uh, living in Jacksonville, Florida. He had run a uh, sawmill down there. He had moved to Fernandina to help work as an engineer for the Florida Railroad with uh, Yuli, 
who of course was a, a great visionary in building a cross-state railroad. As a delegate to the Constitutional Convention in Tallahassee, him and James Cooper made the travel from here over to Tallahassee. And on January 10th, he signed uh, the Ordinances of Secession and voted for Florida to secede from the Union. And Florida did. They voted on January 10th and announced that it's in session. And shortly after that, it was going out on the wire, that's the telegraph wire, um, all around Florida, uh, where they had, of course, telegraphs. Fernandina's Railroad Depot had the telegraph. And there was a big gathering down there at the depot because in the previous days before the actual vote, there was um, constant news that the delegates were discussing the secession of Florida. And uh, they voted 62 to 7 in favor of secession. And so once that had happened, it gets transferred over here. And, of course, everybody's just excited about that. Um, I don't think, you know, in some of the writings, I don't think they really knew what to expect. They had just seceded from the federal union as a state. And what does that mean now? What is the next step? Uh, Finnegan was also the commander of the Fernandina Volunteers in 1858 when the governor of Florida, Governor Perry, had reinstituted the state militia forces. He was elected the captain of the Fernandina Volunteers. And, of course, with the election of Abraham Lincoln as president in December 20th, 1860, South Carolina seceded from the Federal Union. And Finnegan penned a letter to the mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, telling him that the local militia company here at Fernandina, known as the Fernandina Volunteers, was prepared to send 25 of their militiamen to assist in defending Charleston, South Carolina. Major Robert Anderson had withdrawn from Fort Moultrie to Fort Sumter in the harbor, and tensions were pretty high up there, and they were eager to be a part of that. Um, they never were requested, so the militiamen were never sent. But that letter was sent on the 18th of December, uh, which is two days before, before South Carolina seceded from the Union. So tensions were already high throughout the South, especially with the national election and what Lincoln was putting forward. Uh, the preservation of the Federal Union, he had strong stances on the institution of slavery that it should be abolished, and uh, he was willing to defend and protect the Federal Union and preserve it. So Finnegan... Uh, takes over command of the militia, and the militia is called on, actually, to mobilize here, to come together, and they do. And over the course of the next couple of months, they begin to gather in size. There's also a creation of another southern unit known as the Jefferson Davis Rifles of Nassau County. In March of 1861, they also are joined by the Palaka Volunteers, also known as the Palaka Guard. By this time, there are about 260 of them up here, uh, militia units here at Fernandina. And on um, April 8th, they leave from Newtown, travel up the Shell Road, which is Atlantic Avenue, up to the Lighthouse Road, past the Lighthouse, and on their way to Old Town. And on the morning of April 8th, 1861, they march right into Fort Clinch. There is no federal garrison there. The fort had been abandoned. The fort was in caretaker status by James Walker. And the state militia forces went ahead and took formal possession of the fort site. Finnegan goes on to promote pretty quick to a major and military advisor to the governor of Florida, Governor Perry. And then from that, he goes on to promote to the rank of Brigadier General. He eventually, in April 1862, becomes the commander of Middle and East Florida and will serve in Florida uh, pretty much until after the Alusty Campaign of 1864. Um, he will command the southern forces there, which will be a victory over federal forces at a small battlefield 68 miles away from us. It's off of a Highway 90 or also I-10 if you head to the west there. Madison Stark Perry, the governor of Florida, um, was very adamant about Florida's secession from the Union, so much so that he had told General Chase, uh, who was commanding state forces over in Tallahassee and also the Pensacola area, that if it was practical, we should seize the United States military installations in the South. And he was encouraged to do so by Yuli. That's going to get Yuli in trouble later on. <laughs> <laughs> Yuli, of course, the visionary of the Florida Railroad, uh, Florida senator. Uh, he had urged the governor to seize the United States forts and arsenals, pressing on him the importance that we should strike fast, strike quick, take possession of all of the military belonging to the United States within the state boundary and claim it as our own. Those letters are actually sent to Governor Perry before Florida seceded from the Union. So that is treason. 
And those letters are going to come to haunt him at the end of the war when the federal forces occupy Tallahassee and Fernandina, and they find the copies of those letters. And he winds up being imprisoned at Fort Pulaski for a year. Eventually, of course, he's released, comes back and gets the railroad going again, which is in disaster state. But nevertheless, uh, he is really much adamant about Florida seceding from the Union, so much so that he argued in 18... Uh, 45 for Florida to become a state, and in 1860 he's arguing that we should secede from the Federal Union. So to defend Fernandina, well, Fort Clinch had no cannons mounted in it. There was not a single gun out there. So the militia forces leave from Fernandina, they head down the coast to Fort Marion. Everybody been there? Fort Marion. It's also known as the Castile de Saint Marco or the Castle of Saint Marks. It's the oldest settlement in North America. The fort was built 100 years before America fought its War of Independence. Pretty impressive. A lot of work down there. <laughs> so they go down there and they gather up artillery and small arms and they transfer it back here to Fernandina because now they've come to the conclusion that they're going to have to fortify the waterway to maintain an open seaport. So that's what the militia forces do. They go down there, they take cannons and guns from Fort Marion. That's what it was called. It's named after Francis Marion, the swamp fox of the Revolution. That's how I get his name. In the 1930s, it was changed back to the Castle of St. Mark's. This is the flag of the Fernandina Volunteers. We actually have a copy of this flag uh, downstairs in the exhibit hall. It's pretty impressive. This is what they carried out to Fort Clinch on that April 8th day. Yeah. The original flag is in private ownership and is only 70 miles away from where we are here. <laughs> yeah. A uh, friend of mine had the opportunity to acquire the original flag and preserve it. He's very big about preserving Florida history. And uh, that flag sold for $100,000. It is one of a kind. It was made in Charleston, South Carolina. It was presented by the ladies of Fernandina to the Fernandina volunteers. And it's the only flag that they had as an operating military unit here at Fernandina. The flag was, as you see these uh, creases in it, the flag was folded, oh. and it was put into a trunk, and that trunk was loaned, put onto a steamship called the Darlington. And on March 3rd, 1862, when the federal forces began their invasion of Amelia Island, the U.S. Navy is steaming down the waterway right behind us here, and the Darlington is steaming out of the port of Fernandina. Mm -hmm. And that flag is in a trunk, and the Darlington gets captured, and everything on the Darlington now becomes prizes of war. And the officers of the Federal Army and Federal Navy are going through all these items. And what do they find? The Fernandina Volunteer flag. It is taken up north as a prize of war by a naval officer. It is passed down through his family. And eventually his great-granddaughter decides that she wants to let it loose. She realizes that there's some value to it. So she actually brought it here to Fernandina, brought it out to the fort. We looked at it. She shopped it around to the city uh, commissioners here. She wanted uh, like fifteen thousand dollars, you know, for them to buy it. Of course, they didn't buy it. Uh, we didn't buy it either. Uh, the museum, uh, Carmen Gone with time as a director, and would have been a nice addition to the museum, but we weren't able to buy it either. And so um, she basically started shopping it around, and people started telling her what she had, and the value started going up. And Dickie Ferry, I had told him about it, that he needed to see it. He made an opportunity to see it, and he told the lady right then and there, he says, I'll give you $100,000 for this flag. And so wow. there it is. What year was that? This is 1861, and the flag being shopped around Fernandini here was like in 2011, oh, wow. 2010. Wow. Yeah. So not too long ago. What so, is yeah. the bird? It is actually an osprey. Oh, okay. Which, Good. if you've been out to the beach, you see them all over the place. Yeah. They're fish hawks. Uh, they're related to the eagles and the eagle family. So, so what do we need? What kind of liquor do we need to fly him with? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will tell you an inter I'll tell. I'll show you an interesting thing. So, Dicky is very cautious about this flag. Um, my wife and I, when I did my first book, I had to have this flag in the book, and so we went out to McClenny, Florida, to see him at his place there. And the flag was uh, there encased. And I said, you know, I've got to have it. I've got to talk about it. It's significant. And he says, absolutely. He says, take it off the wall. Take it wherever you want and uh, find the best spot to photograph it. We dragged that flag through the living room, the kitchen, 
at the back porch, outside in the sunlight, trying to get the right image of it. And uh, it's after all that dragging it around, because it's in a big case, that he said, you know, that's a $100,000 fly. Cause, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think he told me he paid that. He goes, yeah, it's $100,000. So in um, 2018, I talked to Dickie and I said, listen, we've got to have this flag returned to Fort Clinch. It has not been at the fort since it left. And uh, it's got to come back. And he said, okay, I'll bring it. And in October of, uh, in March, I'm sorry, March of 2018, the flag was on display at the fort uh, during one of our uh, southern programs, our state militia program we do there. And it was there. You could have actually you go up and see it. It's really impressive. And uh, I guess I should tell you a little bit of humor about that. Um, so Dickie decided that him and his friend, they needed a good shrimp dinner. So he left the fort. And they were gone for five hours. I'm like walking around the fort. My coworker Andrew, is here with me. We're walking around the fort. It's like, where's Dickie? Where's Larry? Hey, I haven't seen, you know, you know, where are they at? Nowhere. Come back. And uh, finally, uh, I run into Dickie. He's walking down the side port. I said, uh... What, what gives here? He, I said, you know, we've been looking for you for like four or five hours here. We, you know, the flag and all. He goes, I knew it was in good hands. <laughs> it was at Fort Clinch, and it was where it was supposed to be. And so, yeah, $100,000 flag, you know. <laughs> so we have a copy of it downstairs. So uh, please go down and get a chance to see it there. So the federal invasion um, is going to take place, of course, in March of 1862. But even before that, the Anaconda Plan was instituted, which was the naval blockade of all southern ports. This was the brainchild of General um, Winfield Scott. He came up with it. Let's blockade southern ports, have the U.S. Navy patrol the waterways, stop any ships going in or coming out, and raid them. And, of course, in August of 1862, the USS Jamestown is right off of Fernandina, is patrolling here, and it encounters the Alvarado, which is a merchant ship trying to make it to Port of Fernandina, deliver its goods. The Jamestown gives chase to the Alvarado, which in this, uh, uh, this is a Frank Leslie journal, you can see the Alvarado over here, the Lily Island Lighthouse. The fort is way down over here. But the Jamestown gives chase and is able to run the Alvarado ashore. And this causes a big, big excitement here in Fernandina because the militia unit got called out to actually go do something. You know? <laughs> I mean, believe me, they were bored to death. It was all they could do to go do something. They'd gotten these six-pound field guns. They had four of them. Um, there had been no excitement since they had taken the fort. Uh, they were uh, – <clears throat> pretty much ready to go to do something. So they go hauling down the beach because from the lighthouse, they used it as an observation platform and they were monitoring activities offshore. So they called up the militia forces. So not only is the militia running down the beach, also they're bringing the cannons down, which is by horse artillery, but all the citizens of Fernandina are running down the beach because they want to see what's going on. So the cannons get set up on the shoreline and they start shooting at the Jamestown, but the shots are falling short. There's no way they can hit the Jamestown. Um, pretty much what happened is, is the Jamestown's naval boarding party boarded the Alvarado, was able to set it on fire, uh, the ship would burn to the waterline, and then of course return to the Jamestown and basically make their getaway. But this was such an excitement. I mean, even Yuli went down there, Finnegan went down there, all these citizens are down there. Citizens are cheering every time a cannon gets fired off at the Jamestown, <laughs> and of course there's no hits made, made on the Jamestown or any of the landing the boat parties there. But it's pretty exciting, and they still don't realize that real war is about to come. I mean, it, it's really going to start to change for them pretty quick. So with Fort Clitch sitting empty, they arm the fort. They bring the cannons back from the old Fort St. Augustine. They mount cannons in around the fort. They eventually get to the point where they install roughly 33 pieces of artillery. At the fort site, though, they can't mount any cannons in the fort because the parapet wall was not high enough to install any cannons. And south of the fort, they build a big uh, battery down there to mount artillery there and mount cannons over Cumberland Island. So they're camped out at the fort site. Uh, this is uh, an image from a little bit later on, but it gives a good representation of what they were doing. They were camped within the fort site, and they hated it. It's sand time the sand blew around, it got in their teeth, it got in their nose, it got in the ear, it got in their food. Um, it was The fort was a construction site, and so every time the wind would kick up, the sand would kick up and blow into everything. It was literally miserable out there 
uh, for the southern forces at the fort site. And the level of construction that you see today at Fort Clinch was not the level of construction that the southern forces had when they occupied the fort. Hmm. Um, only the brown brick is what it is in place. And I'll try and point it out for you. So from this point down, this is all brown brick and this is all red brick. So this is where the fort was when the southern forces occupied the fort. Matter of fact, this building wasn't even here. The top of this building wasn't here. And the building here and over here, they were the only two buildings along with the lumber sheds and carpenter shops were the only ones fully completed in the fort and only two walls were fully completed to their full height. Mm -hmm. So the fort was really in a state of construction and not finished yet. That's why there was no artillery there. Hmm. So they built these big massive sand batteries. Uh, this is an image of one of the batteries. Uh, this would be about south of the fort. We've got the waterway behind us there. And basically they just dug out the dirt, laid in timber, brought in these big guns, sandbagged the front. They drilled on them, trained on them, and prepared, but they couldn't shoot. <laughs> they couldn't shoot cannons out there because hmm. one of the things that they were lacking here was cannon powder. You can't shoot cannons without cannon powder, and so you need cannon powder. So there's a lot of photographs of this, of them just standing around doing nothing but posing for the camera, and they never shoot the cannons. Um, and if you notice, there are no cannonballs down here. There's no cannonballs around here. That's another thing they lacked was, was cannonball ammunition. <laughs> Here in town, big excitement, you know, going throughout the year. Uh, of course, now they're starting to hear of the southern victories up north there, as well as um, <clears throat> the increasing naval blockade that's taking place and moving southward. But nevertheless, they're excited. Of course, uh, Christmas is coming up. Christmas was a big, joyful time here on the island. By December 1861, uh, they had uh, 3,000 Confederate forces on Amelia Island. It was the largest gathering of Confederate forces in northeast Florida. We would not see that number again until the Battle of the Lusty, which takes place on February 20th, 1864. But business was good in town. If you were a merchant, you could sell to the Confederacy, to the soldiers. You could rent rooms. Officers rented rooms. Some of them were taken into various homes as guests. The soldiers were camped all about the island. There's one of the encampments here. I had these tents all set up. hard to believe they only bathe like once or twice a week. <laughs> uh, pretty rough, huh? Another battery here, another artillery position. 33 pieces of artillery are mounted around the islands here for defense of the waterway. This gentleman is Captain McBlair. He was placed in command of the artillery uh, for the defenses here, and he's got a big job to do. And he's trying to do it, and he has limited supply, so much so that he is constantly writing off letters to the governor of Florida, to the military department commander, Robert E. Lee, telling them that we need the powder and we need the ammunition. If we're going to defend Amelia Island, Fernandina, and the Cumberland Waterway, we need to have these items. And, of course, he hears a lot of, yes, it's on its way to, yes, we're going to get it to you. <laughs> yeah. Typical government. Doesn't show up. Just like a bank want to give you money when you're no longer broke. <laughs> so Robert E. Lee comes down in January 1862, takes a tour of inspection, looks over the defenses. He's impressed with them. He's impressed with the troops. Looks really good. He leaves. And on February 19th, he sends a telegram to the department commander, James Trapier, saying, I'm giving you an order to evacuate Amelia Island, Fernandina, and Cumberland Sound defenses and Fort Clinch. Uh, you are to remove all the artillery first and then evacuate the troops uh, to the mainland. We will take up another strategic line of defense further inland. There is no way that we can defend the waterway. You do not have enough ammunition. You do not have enough supplies. And the Federal Army with their shallow draft vessels uh, being transported by the Navy is going to come down the intercoastal waterways and take the position from the rear. And so you need to leave. And so he issues the orders of evacuation. And literally, they evacuate by train. And so they bring everything down here to the uh, railroad yard here. They load up on the trains. They start getting out of here. The trains are constantly running back and forth. Um, troops, supplies, logistics, everything's going out. But the citizens of Fernandina are reluctant to leave. They believe that they're going to hold on a little bit longer. They keep making announcements. Listen, this, this is it. We're leaving. 
And if you don't leave with us, you will now be under federal authority because they're coming. There's no doubt about it. They're on their way. And, of course, the citizens still delay, still delay, still delay. Finally, about two days before the federal forces begin to arrive, that's when the citizens start to make the final move, to move to the, the railroad depot, load on the trains. And, of course, you imagine you have a home here. I'm, I'm, all of you have homes. What are you going to take and what are you going to leave behind? And you only have roughly about 24 to 48 hours to figure that out. Hey, welcome course. to Hurricane Yeah, there you go. <laughs> For me, I just take a cooler of beer and I'm good to go. Hey. <laughs> but nevertheless, they do leave. And in leaving, the federal naval force enters the waterway. The Ottawa's in the steam in the lead there of the federal vanguard. And it catches the last train pulling away from the railroad depot. And on that train is General Finnegan, Yuli, a handful of citizens, as well as the rear guard of Confederate forces. And the Ottawa literally starts shelling the train as it's going down the tracks. So much so that they score a hit on the train and kill two boys, Savage and Thompson, uh, disrail a number of the cars, stop the train, um, but the conductors and brakemen are able to disconnect the damaged cars, get the train going again, and they make their escape. And once they cross over the trestle bridge, the Confederate forces set fire to the bridge. The Ottawa now gets up into the river, realizes it can't go any further, has to turn around and come back up to Fernandina to shallow up that way. And in doing so, the Ottawa catches the Darlington, the steamship, which I believe will be our next one, making its escape and goes after it. Captain Brock, captain of the Darlington, oh, he's, he's a diehard Confederate. He's not going to give up the ship no matter what. Shot and shell are splashing all around it. Women and children are on there. There's no Confederate soldiers other than a Confederate major who's actually a doctor. And uh, the shells are splashing all around. The women are pleading him to stop because the Ottawa is basically boxing in the target and the rounds are getting closer and closer. And they're screaming for him to stop and he will not. Finally, he realizes he's not going to outrun the Ottawa. There's no way. Mm -hmm. And so he's forced to yield. They capture the Ottawa and, of course, all the baggage on board and, of course, the Fernandina volunteer flag. So, Confederate forces are gone. So, Great Snake and a, and a Conda plan blockade all southern ports. Now, this is important because even before the first major land battle took place, which would be Bull Run or Manassas, uh, July 21st, 1861, in an office in the War Department on July 5th, they met to discuss how important our little seaport town was. So important that they wanted to have it and that they were going to put together an expeditionary force to sail here to take it. Because to maintain the naval blockade, they would need an effective port facility to operate out of. And Fernandina has it. Um, in my uh, second book, I give you a detailed account. It's actually the letter that was um, sent out as to the importance of Fernandina and why they wanted it. Because once the southern states had all seceded, the United States Navy lost every southern naval base. Um, even though you had Fort Taylor, Key West still under federal control and Fort Jefferson, you lost major port facilities to operate out of. The southern uh, port facility uh, for the U.S. Navy was at Pensacola. They had a big dry dock yard there, so Pensacola was very critical. So to maintain the naval blockade southward and northward up to Hampton Roads, Virginia, they needed a deep water port to operate, and Fernandina was the prize. So the South Atlantic fleet is going to take base here at Fernandina. they got 48 ships in the fleet. It's commanded by a two-star admiral. His name is DuPont, Samuel F. DuPont. Hmm. And so they're going to make the base here, and they're going to maintain the naval blockade south to Key West and north to Hampton Roads, Virginia. And on any given day, if you were out here in the waterway, there'd be about 20 ships sitting at anchor. Other ships being repaired on and other ships offshore patrolling the coastline. So the great snake. The expeditionary force was assembled at Hampton Roads, Virginia. It was the largest gathering of the United States Navy vessels, vessels, and it consisted of 77 ships and 13,000 troops. And they were heading south, and not for the winter. <laughs> General Wright was placed in command of the Army forces, um, which would take Hilton Head, Port Royal, South Carolina. Uh, from there, they would then advance uh, further south. Um, this is the senior commanding officer commanding the overall expedition. Uh, this is General Thomas 
uh, here. He is the main commander, uh, Sherman Thomas, and so he is actually the guy in charge of the 13,000 troops, and General Wright is commanding the brigade that will come here. They make the landings here at Fernandina, um, at Old Town, up at the fort site, and here at Newtown as well. Uh, this is actually here to see the Warren, Florida, Old Fernandina, Amelia Island, looking uh, northeast, showing the old Spanish earthworks. I still don't see them up there. <laughs> that would be old Fort San Carlos. I still don't see it. It says old Spanish earthworks. I, I mean, even today, you don't see it. I see a couple of buildings. I think one of these buildings is the old church up there, the old Catholic church up there. Hmm. So, yeah. So, there's General Wright, commander of the brigade that takes here. They had 3,500 federal troops that landed on Amelia Island, and they put pretty much most of them ashore within about three and a half hours. And they loved it too because the town was vacant. I mean, there was like, you know, soldiers going down the street carrying furniture, and <laughs> silverware. One soldier had two ducks. He was asked by one of the sergeants, what are you going to do with this duck? He says, well, this is for tomorrow's meal, and this is for today's meal. <laughs> I mean, it was a, they looted the town like you wouldn't believe. Boy, they, because there's really nobody here other than a handful of civilians, uh, some senior folks, and, of course, uh, slaves that had not been taken when the Confederate forces and their owners left, which was really good because now they were liberated by federal troops. They're marching down 2nd Street here. Uh, this is from Frank Leslie right there, eyewitness by the uh, journalist. There's the town. I don't see any people in any of these photos. In this photo. There's nobody around. So you can imagine that. You pretty much have the run of the town. And it's nice because they picked out the houses they wanted too. Like, I want this house, and I want that house, and I live here, so it's kind of interesting. Was that old Fernandina? Uh, this is actually Newtown. Okay. This is right here where we are. Federal forces, they uh, realize that the threat is from the mainland, so they establish new artillery batteries facing to the west. Uh, they move guns around that were left behind by the Confederates. They bring in more artillery. They build the uh, Old Town Battery. They have a New Town Battery. Uh, they have artillery positions up there at the fort site as well. Now they're mounting cannons in the fort because they're involved in the construction of the fort. And so they build the fort to a level in which they can put guns in. They established the Post Army Hospital here in Fernandina. And uh, it was up on North 3rd Street at the corner of 3rd and Center. Uh, the lower level of the building was the receiving, the second level was the ward, and the third level was where they conducted surgeries, uh, tend to the uh, medical needs of federal forces, as well as the small civilian population here. Uh, as um, uh, the one doctor said, we have the sick, lame, and the lazy here. <laughs> <laughs> Some days we have all three of them. Now, uh, it's interesting to note that you got four ounces of whiskey, uh, if you could be convincing, and if you weren't convincing that you were sick, you got four ounces of casserole and sulfur. <laughs> yeah, better to be convincing. <laughs> Another Frank Leslie, uh, federal troops inside the fort, federal troops outside the fort as well. Here's a fort site here, our big massive cannons. These are 15 inch guns, they weigh 50,000 pounds. Yeah. They throw a cannonball that weighs 328 pounds. They have a range of 4,800 yards. Yeah, I feel sorry for the guys that hold that around. <laughs> <laughs> Presbyterian Church, any members here? No? It's not too late to convert? No. <laughs> oh, there you go. So Presbyterian Church was used as an army barracks here on the island. Uh, along with St. Peter's uh, up at the head of center. Both of them were used, not the current St. Peter's, the older St. Peter's, which was in the back, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, they were used as army barracks uh, during the Civil War. Uh, they took out all the pews, put them outside so they could sit in around campfires and all that out on the, the grass there. And then inside they had all these bunk beds built. And so they were sleeping in there. And this is just right around the corner from where Yuli's house was, which was the army headquarters during the Civil War. This is the picket detachment uh, guarding one of what is the ferry services. They had a ferry service that crossed over the waterway uh, in addition to the trestle bridge so that you could basically, you bring your wagons down here, they load the wagon up on a little ferry and they ferry it across over there. And so it's one of the picket posts down there looking across the narrow point there in the Amelia River. Uh, Fort Clinch, the guard room prisons, these are the only two buildings that the Confederates could use. Uh, these were also used by the federal forces. The building on the left there is the guard house, and the building on the right was the prison. 
Uh, we have three levels of confinement there, loose confinement, closed confinement, solitary confinement. Depending on what you did wrong is how long you'd be incarcerated out there. And so uh, you could be kept in there up to roughly 84 days. Union forces. Uh, the men here that served here at Amelia Island were from New York, Pennsylvania, Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Ohio. 107th Ohio was here. Um, they were the primary force uh, here on the island. They were responsible for security. They were responsible <coughs> for military operations in the area, securing of the island. This soldier is one of the soldiers from the 7th Connecticut that served here on the island during the war. At the high point, they had 2,800 federal troops on Amelia Island. Um, that's not counting the troops that were stationed at the fort. So it's a pretty good sizable number of forces. One of my favorite ladies, Harriet Tubman. Did y'all know that she visited here twice? Very important. She was um, conducting operations uh, for the Federal Army. She was going up the river, the St. Mary's River, bringing out people that were uh, in bondage, bringing them to safety here on Amelia Island. Uh, she worked with uh, Colleen Merrick to the orphanage here as well. We also gave an inspiring talk to um, colored men here on the island to join the Federal Army and serve in the Federal Army, so much so that they recruited the 21st United States Colored Troops here on Amelia Island. Um, so pretty important. Um, she was uh, very much um, a big player here, um, but also during the war. And a lot of her activities they really didn't know about. Like when she arrived here at Fernandina, a lot of people didn't know who she was. But she carried around this golden pass signed by the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, <laughs> that allowed her to go anywhere she wanted and pretty much do anything she wanted. The senior commanders here on the island knew who she were, was and were inspecting her to show up and arrive. And so she was uh, pretty important here. And I think that there's, I watched the movie Harriet Tubman, I was very disappointed, they didn't even mention about her being here. I think they could have mentioned we, her being We here. don't mention it. No. I mean, there's no No, there's, it's, it's, it's significant that it should be mentioned. So in, in the book, I made a mention of her and her activities here. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, and we need to put up one of those cardboard cutouts or something. I know. <laughs> we do. Yeah, we need to. We need to. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, it's pretty big what she did and her activities. This is uh, Yuli's house. Um which was used as Army Headquarters. This is actually the sentry box right here. Um, up here are postings. These would be general orders posted from headquarters. Uh, Frank, where, where would that uh, This be? is um, right next to the library, next to uh, Villa oh. Palmas there. It's in that vacant lot. There's a little marker right there. Oh, on the other side of the fence, you walk, I, I take the volunteers that are at the fort and go, well, this was Army Headquarters. Don't, if yeah. you, got, you want to go on a walking tour, go on a walking tour with me. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> How many days does it last? <laughs> it lasts a long time. That's why usually no one wants to go with me. Because <laughs> I'm like, well, on this side here was this. I mean, let me talk about the Civil War stuff. If you take the walking tours here, they're really impressive. They talk a lot more than the Civil War. You need to take the walking tour of the museum. Yes. Yeah, don't go with me because like some of the Fort volunteers are here and they'll tell you, boy, we're out there like at midnight walking around. <laughs> <laughs> the Ottawa, the uh, steamship that fired on the last train, captured the Darlington. She was a 90-day gunboat known as an Adela class. Um, yeah, pretty impressive. They knocked these boats together in 90 days. Remember, that was a low bidder. <laughs> but she operated out of the port of Fernandina throughout the war. Pretty significant. And, of course, you know, here's a map of the area. Give you an idea of the main shipping channel, Fort Clinch up at the top. Uh, old town, new town, railroad. Uh, waterways here. I mean, from Newtown to open ocean is a mile. They loved it. They could sail right out of here, come right around, and they're into deep water, and they're gone. It's a great place for the federal fleet to operate from to maintain the naval blockade. Fort Clinch again. I don't know why I got a lot of pictures of Fort Clinch. <laughs> Fort Clinch again. <laughs> uh, I like this picture. You got the flag and all that, the cannon down there in the parade field. I mean, it's a really, really unique site. It's it's interesting, though, that no battles ever fought there. You know, built as a deterrent, uh, served its purpose without uh, ever being in a battle. Soldiers of the 1st New York Engineers, which were assigned to Fort Clinch and Amelia Island, they were involved in the construction of the fort. Uh, they arrived here March 1862, and they muster out June 1865, finally heading home. War's over for them. Yeah. 
long time. Uh, they did all the red brick that was constructed in the fort in mm -hmm. roughly two years. There's five and a half million bricks out there in the fort site, and only a million and a half are needed to complete the fort. So they were really busy out there at the site. <laughs> uh, you can't find that type of uh, work today, can you? <laughs> Alfred F. Sears, commanding officer of Fort Clinch, also the chief engineer in charge of the fort. Um, he was here in Fernandina before the Civil War. He was an engineering, uh, civil engineer, and he was hired to represent the New York investors that were investing in Yulee's Railroad. Hmm. And so he actually, uh, it's pretty bad, he gave a very, very... Uh, critical uh, letter he had put together about the building of the railroad under Daniel Callahan and how it wasn't very safe and you wouldn't want to run any trains on it. So, yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty scary, you know, I mean, I'm surprised that they kept him around. But he comes back as the engineering officer for the fort and that's ironic. Here he is here in Fernandina before the war and now he's here as a Union Army officer commanding the fort's construction, and the first New York engineers. So, colored soldiers. I think they do not receive the recognition they should. Uh, we had the 4th, uh, uh, we had the 7th year, we had the 8th United States Colored Troops, the 21st was recruited. In 1863, we had the first all-black regiment to serve here at Fernandina. The first South Carolina arrives here. They were the nucleus for what became the open door for all the other colored regiments. They were recruited at Hilton Head, South Carolina, and they were recruited from all former slaves. And their recruitment started in May of um, 1862. And so it's pretty early. Before the 54th Massachusetts, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, mm -hmm. I mean, this is before them. So they're recruited, they're organized, they're trained, and they are the test unit. This is what the War Department is going to watch, is the 1st South Carolina's military operations here in Fernandina and up the St. Mary's River. So they arrive here in January 1863, they take a boat ride up the St. Mary's River, and they get into a battle of a place called the Hundred Pines, a little township up there they're able to take hold of. They're on a mission to destroy lumber mills and also go as far as the St. Mary's up 30 miles to the old brickyard that provided bricks to the fort, see if they could bring bricks back to the fort. So they prove themselves in combat. They're led by Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who was a former minister, and was um, he was known as one of the Silent Six. He was a backer of John Brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember the uh, crates marked Bibles, but they had guns in them? Yeah, well, he was involved in that. So he was their colonel, and he conducts them up the river, and they are successful. They come back, and uh, basically that's what opens the door for really the full recruitment of men of color into the federal armies of 1st South Carolina. Now out west, they've got the, uh, what is it, the 1st Kansas out there. And over in um, New Orleans, uh, General Butler has the Corps de Africa that is being uh, organized and recruited. But the 1st South Carolina, they are the first. They're all being recruited at the later on, but they are the first full black regiment to be recruited and see service uh, before really any of the others do. So, and they're here throughout the island. Matter of fact, um, from September 1864 to the end of the war, the only full regiment of infantry serving on Amelia Island is the 34th United States Colored Troops. Pretty significant. Um, there's only a small detachment of soldiers from the 1st New York Engineers, and they're engineering soldiers, not infantry, and they're assigned to the fort. So the 34th United States Color Troops is securing Fernandina, Old and New Town, and the waterfront. And they carried out uh, their soldiering duties out here. So much so that they used to do their drills on the streets of Fernandina so that the former slaves that were now here, the hundreds of them that had come over, almost a thousand of them, could actually see what they were doing. Mm -hmm. soldiers. Pretty impressive. This is a picture of the uh, 34th United States Colored Troops formed up. This is a typical picture of colored soldiers. I like this fellow right here. He, he's smiling. <laughs> you can see they're all, they're all together there. They're all dressed, but you know, taking pride in their uniforms. They look good. Um, 
I mean, it's amazing what they did. I mean, 180,000 men of color served in the Federal Army during the Civil War. I mean, you know, uh, 33,000 of them died during the conflict. And so, uh, and it opened the door because after the war was over, uh, we also recruited for um, the cavalry out west, the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, and so, it really, the service that we see from the fir first South Carolina uh, really opened the door for future and other black regiments to be created. This is uh, Captain Martin. He was the garrison commander here at Fernandina in charge of the defenses of the town in the uh, post war era. Uh, his job was to supervise the last few months of the Civil War until it brought to a conclusion, but also the returning of Southerners that lived over on the mainland that now were coming back to Fernandina. And there's the streets of Fernandina. And uh, uh, I found this interesting. You know, these are all three men of color mm -hmm. right here with two more in the back. So there we are. All right. I'll leave right. you with that. What street is that? I don't know. I like to say, I think it's Center Street because there's a steeple down here. Okay. There's a church here, so I'm thinking it's Center Street, but I might Big, be might be mistaken. Big Street. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's can you imagine street. having streets like that today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Down that road. Yeah, so. All right, let's answer. Let's do questions because I, I know I bored you to death. No, <laughs> so, what would you like to know? That's why. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Anything? Wow. Oh, I just am uh, amazed that we don't have more, you know, historical markers and things that deal with, you know, this era and and what you're talking about is is the fact that history is made by the people who have power, and uh, uh, I do think that. Um, you know, I had no idea Harriet Tubman. <laughs> well, you know, and I'm, you know, yeah. consider myself an educated person. Yeah. But that needs to be corrected. It does. She needs to be here. Um, so up at Central Park, it, it, there's um, Buccaneer Field up there. We have the Central Park area. That area, the reason why that's such an open area there, that is where the um, troops from the Spanish-American War were camped. There were 7,500 of them here on Amelia Island yeah, during 1898. So that area is where they were camped at. And there's no marker for that. Thomas, uh, Raymond Thomas, they were, we were working on markers. Uh, Dave, you talked about markers and having more historic markers around the town to point out things like this. So, yeah. 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 What else? Anything else? Yes. So the, the men of color, where did they were stationed at. Okay, so the Federal Army at this time is segregated. Um, so what they did is at Fort Clinch, there were temporary wooden barracks buildings outside the fort. The colored troops occupied that while the white troops were in the fort. Mm -hmm. Later on, that role switched. The black troops were in the fort, and a small detachment of engineers oh, really? were outside the fort later on. Oh. Here in town, they took up residence in the buildings. When the 34th U.S. Color Troops took over in 1864 and were the only primary infantry unit on the island, they took up the Presbyterian Church, they took up St. Peter's and a number of the vacant homes. They also were in encampments, and uh, also down here at the docks, mm -hmm. there were a couple of warehouses that were converted into living quarters. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Jacksonville was garrisoned by colored troops, as I've read. Yes. Were they involved with these guys at all? Yeah, some of the units that served here at Fernandina would also serve at Jacksonville, and so they were moving them back and forth. So you'd see them here for a couple of months, and then they'd be transported to Jacksonville. They'd be there a couple of months, and then they'd come back up here for a couple of months. So they were going back and forth. Of the cannons, I've been told several different stories about them. Were they brought here from St. Augustine and then they were later carried back to St. Augustine? No, they stayed here. Um, so what happened was when the Federal Army took over, whatever cannons were not taken by the Confederates when they abandoned the island, the Federals made use of them and then they brought in additional cannons. So all the cannons that were brought up from Fort Marion, the old castle, St. Mark's there, uh, were either... Fifteen of them were left behind by the Confederates. Out of the 33, the rest of them were taken by the Confederates. They eventually went over to um, Pensacola, were used in defenses there. Some of them were used in defenses on the Suwannee River. But the 15 did stay here. Matter of fact, if you go to St. Augustine today, you go on top of the fort, they've got an 8-inch mortar sitting up there that was captured at Fernandina. It's a Spanish mortar brought from 
there, St. Augustine to Fernandino, and was in the railroad bridge battery right over here, uh, guarding the uh, trestle bridge that crossed over the Amelia River, and it was captured by federal forces. And eventually it went back to St. Augustine, but that was back in the 1930s because it was a Spanish cannon. Maybe, maybe that's what I yes, heard then. So. <clears throat> Go ahead, sir. The story about Rose's Bluff, the first people going to Rose's Bluff, you shared that before, haven't you? I have. I've talked about that before. So, what else, folks? Uh, are you going to talk about the uh, the re re rebuilding of Fernandino? Yeah, uh, we could talk about the reconstruction. So, so after the war is over, um, we have the uh, Southerners that are now returning. Uh, the state is moving forward. They repeal the ordinances of secession, um, but there's a really nasty thing that happens. They the state institutes what are known as black codes, which limits the, the rights of, of colored persons now living here on the island and throughout the South. Um, but nevertheless, it is significant enough that the, the Reconstruction, the post-war, sees that the black community elects Alphys, uh, Adolphus Mott as the mayor. Um, and matter of fact, it happens at a time when Solomon P. Chase um, is taking a tour of the South. He's the uh, used to be the, he's the Secretary of the Treasury, but he was Supreme Court Justice. He comes down here and actually swears in Adolphus Mott. So an all-black uh, voting uh, pool voted in Adolphus Mott, who was a small little French guy, and he, of course was white as the mayor in the post-war year. The uh, returning Southerners, what they do is they work with federal forces that have now returned to the island. These are veterans now out of the Union Army, and they help to rebuild the railroad. They rebuild the town, and they work really closely together. you got uh, Major Durier who comes here. Uh, he's a Union Army major. He's working with um, George Fairbanks, who was a Confederate major. And so this type of uh, friendship, even though they had been enemies at one time, even though they had different uh, political ideas and different philosophies about how things should have been, whether it should have been a preservation or it should have been states' rights with the right to maintain property ownership, which include the right to maintain slaves as property. Um, they did work very well together to rebuild the town and get us ahead and bring us into our golden era. And we see that countlessly. Um, it's interesting to note that there were hardships for the black community here, but I see a lot of um, former color soldiers taking the lead in civic community here on the island as well as also working for county and city government in key positions, which is also really interesting. So, what else? Tell us about the uniforms you have up there. Um, so these are two uniforms. The one on the right there is a Brigadier General in the Confederacy. Uh, that is the uh, uniform that you would have seen. Um, the one here on the left is a Major General in the Union Army. That's up. And where are, are they reconstruction? Yeah, these ones are, are repros uh, that I brought out. Um, <clears throat> and so put them up here so you folks can see, get an idea of different colors. They did wear gray. They also did wear blue, the South did too. And the North wore gray uh, early in the war. <laughs> Led to a lot of friendly fire. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Other than ships, were there, uh, was there a naval presence here, facilities or anything like that? Yeah, the. Uh, Waterfront is where all the naval activities were. They uh, gave the sailors leave time there. Um, they also had the Marines that were coming off the ships. The west of the fort site was known as Battleship Anchorage, which where the ships that could not be tied up to the piers here at Fernandina would sit at anchor, and then all these little launch boats would go back and forth, transporting sailors and Marines to shore. Um, you have to understand, Fernandina was very popular, and with its popularity came the prostitutes. So, uh, we'd like to hear you a humorous story about prostitution here in Fernandina on the Civil War. Sure, why not? Why not? I'll tell you anyway. That's next. Uh, I'm going to look at my time. So, um, there's a disturbance in Old Town in 1864. The Provost Marshal's called out there. He arrives at Old Town, and upon his arrival, he found several sailors of the fleet laying out in the street, spread eagle where they gazed upon the heaven above them. He also found several women laying out in the middle of the street, also gazing upon heaven, all in a state of uh, unconsciousness. Apparently a fight broke out inside one of the whorehouses up on Lady Street, and uh, the army decided to throw everybody through the plate glass window oh. into the road, and apparently beat up the sailors. And so uh, it was a pretty interesting night up there at Old Town. So prostitution, yeah, was a, was a big to-do, especially for the Navy. It's a mariner town. I mean, prostitution existed before the Navy showed up here. 
<laughs> and it existed later on in the golden era too. What is it? Um, what is it? Uh, the what do we have like uh. Uh, how many was it? Nineteen brothels and how many churches? Nineteen brothels yeah. and uh, twelve churches. Yeah, so you know, <laughs> after you're there, you gotta go somewhere yeah. to get reborn. So you yeah. start it all over again. So, yeah. <laughs> that was interesting. What, what happened to the fort after the war? And uh, was it maintained as a fort or was it a bay? Yeah, the army stayed there till 1869, and then the fort was placed into caretaker status. It would stay that way till 1898, when the fort was reactivated from the Spanish-American War. Right after that war, it went back into caretaker status, and it stayed that way till 1926, when the federal government struck the property and sold it. Um, they sold the uh, parcels off. Uh, they were bought locally. Uh, it did change hands a couple of times. In 1935, the state of Florida was able to acquire the property, and they acquired 1,100 acres. And then over the next couple of years, they bought additional acreage, which brought to 1,426 acres, which includes the fort site. So, yeah. The two uniforms up there, there's one blue and one gray. I've been reading these um, these. Show. I don't know if the author's name yeah. is. Oh, okay. And they talk about the, the, the boys in Butternut. Yes. Butternut. Yeah, Butternut, it, um, what they do is, is um, it's a, um, it's like a tan uniform. It's like, um, it's tan in color because of lack of dyes. Mm. They don't have the dyes to dye it, so they're using uh, nuts, uh, Butternuts to dye uniforms. They also use peas. Uh, you have a pea green uniform. I don't know about that one. But yeah, it's a lack of dyes. They don't have the indigos to dye uniforms, and so they have a butternut uniform. So yeah, it would be a, it would be a tan uniform. Yeah. What else? What about the orphanage that Finnegan started and has transferred over the? Prison? Oh, Colleen Merrick's. So Finnegan's house. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. So what happened was is that he comes back after the war, trying to acquire his house, and he's not able to. She's already paid the taxes on it and now has ownership of the home, and she's running it as an orphanage. And so he's really upset by that. Um, Finnegan has a really hard time after the war's over because um, he owned a lot of stock in the Florida Railroad, and it was worthless. I mean, Yuli's locked up, and he believes that Yuli has basically run off with the railroad treasury, and he wants, he wants his cut. And so it's, it's really nasty. Um, it's really Finnegan that tells the Federals where they can find the letters that will incriminate Yuli as a traitor. And he, 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 he did, yeah. Uh, Finnegan, eventually he goes to Savannah, he works there. He eventually moves back to Jacksonville. He's buried in the Old Town Cemetery down there in Jacksonville. Some of us have gone down there to his grave. But he wanted his home back. He had a big home built up there on Atlantic, there where Atlantic Elementary is. I mean, it was like 20-something, 20 23, 28-room home. I mean, it was amazing. It was I think we have a photograph. We have a photograph here in the museum of it. So, yeah, and he wanted that house back, but he couldn't. She had already acquired it through the taxes. What happened to the history of it after that? With the um, I don't think it survived the fire of Fernandina. I think that's what happened. It burned down. So, I don't, we'd have to look. But I, last thing I heard was it burned down in the fire. Really nice home, too. What else? Oh, oh, if you want to know about Yuli's home, you know what they did with that? The city of Fernandina decided to stucco the wood outside of the house, and it rotted away. That's why it's not there. All right. What's that? Termites. No. What else? Anything else? Good. I will. Time to go. Well, read the book. There's a lot of good stories in there. I got a lot of quotes. I, um, any of you know Mary? Did you know Mary Agnes and Bob White? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I have an outstanding collection of letters that they gave me many, many years ago when I was the president of the Historical Society, and a lot of those letters are quoted in the book, so you can actually read them. Working on a third book. It's called In Their Own Words. And it literally is their own words. It's the soldiers' letters and accounts of Amelia Island during the Civil War and Spanish-American War. You'll be able to read their original letter, 
which will be a copy in the book, but also a transcribe. If you can't read that chicken scratch, <laughs> I used to have good vision. I don't anymore, and that's from going. What is that for? <laughs> well, thank you, folks. Thank you all for coming. And the museum is selling Frank's newest book, and he will be signing them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>